Bitcoin, get rich or die trying. Next slide, please. What is it? Bitcoin's a cryptocurrency, a money based on open source cryptographic protocol that is independent of any central authority. No, don't don't advance. Thank you. We uh, of course we haven't practiced because we haven't practiced. So uh, it's digital currency with the following unique attributes, which of course I could list probably fifty or hundred of them. But uh, some things I thought of this morning when I was writing the speech. <laughs> I did get up early, but anyway. Um, there's, uh, there will be 21 million Bitcoins seeded uh, when it's completed. Um, they're not inflatable. This is um, a big deal. Um, people that haven't ever um, considered monetary policy. Later in the speech, hopefully when, uh, when uh, the therapy kicks in, uh, I'll ramble about that some more. Um, the, and of course, the limit is built in intentionally, and I'll get into more of that later. There's no central authority. Accounts cannot be frozen. Transaction avoid legacy banking industry. There's no transaction limit. Transactions cannot be reversed. There's increasing difficulty to mine, which of course I'll get into that. And it's divisible by eight decimal places, as in point zero zero zero. All right, next slide. How does it work? It's all about the blocks. The block of data is run through an algorithm. Double SHA-256 encryption. Is there any cryptography experts in the room? Okay. Um, it uh, requires, as you, uh, many of you know, encryption requires a lot of uh, CPU horsepower to turn through it. And double SHA-256 requires an extreme amount of CPU to turn through it. Uh, blocks contain the pattern hash for all previous blocks. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the system is based on a proof of work. A proof of work is a piece of data that it was difficult to produce, so as to suffice, satisfy certain requirements. Producing a proof of work can be a random process with low probability. So a lot of trial and error is required on average before a valid proof of work is generated. Next. Proofs of work are used in Bitcoin for block generation. Proofs of work are tied to the data of each block are required for the blocks to be accepted. Low probability of successful generation. This makes it unpredictable which worker will be able to generate the next block. Next slide. Each block contains the hash of the preceding block, thus each block has a chain of blocks that together contain a large amount of work. Changing a block, which can be done by making a new block containing the same press server, requires generating all successors and redoing the work they contain. This protects the blockchain from tampering. So you have all this history going back in time that is a mind-boggling amount of calculation for it to ever be redone to break it. So, at, and I'll get into, uh, I'm sure somebody might be thinking, yo, oh, can I hack it? So this is one of those uh, parts of the uh, puzzle there that uh, so far have made it uh, unbreakable. Enlist our physicist that was speaking yesterday that. I think he's working on a time machine or something. Gets that quantum computing going, and then you could he could probably work it. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, I'm ahead on my notes. Each user has a personal wallet where his or her coins are stored. Your wallet may have multiple addresses to receive with simultaneously, and additional addresses can be created on demand for free. That's also an important aspect. How many people in this room have Bitcoin wallets? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Anybody else that put their hand down? So we've got about 70% of the room, I would say, does have a Bitcoin wallet. Um, 
if uh, if I get any if anybody uh, knows more than I do and gets any of this wrong, of course, you get to come up here and rant at me at the very end. Next slide, please. So, Bitcoin wallets. So, those of you that that don't have one, haven't seen one, there's an example address. That, that is my very first uh, Bitcoin wallet address. Wallets can receive payments while offline. Traditional wallets work like databases that update from peer-to-peer -peer transaction list when resynced. So think about just how a PC that's going to pop mail, even when it's off, it comes back online, and it, it gets the updated email popped onto it, right? So... Um, individual PCs that run this traditional wallet client that actually keep an entire blockchain history I was talking about earlier, they will actually resynchronize via peer-to-peer -peer scheme and download all these blocks. Next slide, please. Um, one thing that there's a lot of uh, people that aren't in the Bitcoin community assume and people that are in the Bitcoin community realize is the anonymity. Tracing a coin's history can be used to connect identities to addresses. Main problem is that every transaction is publicly logged. Everyone can see the flow of coins from address to address. This information can't identify anyone because addresses are just random numbers, like the one I showed you in the previous slide. But if any of the addresses in the transaction can be tied to an identity, it might be possible to work from that point and infer who owns all the other addresses. This identity information might come from network analysis, surveillance, or just Googling the address. There are um, more than one website that keep uh, transaction histories and post them. And if you just go and look at it, it's just a bunch of numbers, but you can, uh, you can go back and you can see this address sent this address money over and over and over and over in the amount. So um, there's that, that data available. Officially encouraged practice of using a new address for every transaction is designed to make this attack more difficult. And like I said previously, the, um, you can on demand for free inside the wallet create additional addresses. Uh, unique history perspective. A lot of people that even uh, participate with Bitcoins um, aren't aware of this uh, history. Um, there's an in influence from the cypherpunk list and movement of the 1990s. I personally recall being at the uh, Beyond Hope conference in New York City in the 1990s and there was a very, uh, a very prevalent thinking um, I remember getting from speakers and influential people in the room, and that was, we should, not just hackers, but every private citizen should be encrypting everything, whether it's sensitive or it's not sensitive. Um, and of course, at that time, when the Beyond Hope conference took place, um, this was no longer a pipe dream because everybody at that time had 32-bit processors, and the PGP software was available to everybody. Um, the tie into this was that uh, cypherpunk list and movement, there was a white paper published on the cypherpunk mailing list proposing a digital currency, B money, letter B dash M-O-N-E-Y. Um, this is the precursor to Bitcoins. Um, some people know this, some people don't know this, so I wanted to take time and get into this. Um, anybody that's, that's curious about this, I would encourage you to Google uh, B-Money and read a little bit more about this. Next slide, please. Why well, care? Bitcoin has advantages for both buyer and seller with convenience. Online shopping is as easy as using a credit card. For the, for the seller, there's a huge advantage with no transaction fee and an irreversible transactions. Transactions could be anonymous to the extent I talked about previously. Most importantly, Bitcoin has achieved critical mass. There are many users participating, just like you saw. 70% of the room has a Bitcoin wallet. Uh, we can now find 
the Bitcoin-centric economy developing. Next slide, please. Um, oh, good, I'm off. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, next slide. Next slide's good. That's, that's a good slide right there. Is anybody thirsty yet? Next slide. Mining. Um, this is one thing I get a lot of. Yeah, go ahead. That's what they're there for. You ready for another one yet? All right. Next slide, please. What does it mean to mine? What is it doing? Mining is a process of using computer, process, computer power to process transactions, secure the network, and keep all nodes synchronized together. It has been designed to be fully decentralized. Mining will still be required after the last Bitcoin is issued because of the transaction verification. In addition to the need to verify future transactions, obviously. So, backing up. I said earlier there'd be 21 million Bitcoins that are being seeded in. And uh, so after all the Bitcoins are mined, there'll still be mining going on for the necessity of verifying transactions. And there's micro transaction fees built into the network. So sometimes when you send Bitcoins, it will ask you if you want to pay a fee. Sometimes it'll ask ask you to pay a mandatory fee that's a, in essence a nominal fee that fee gets rolled back in to service the miners that are verifying transactions next slide please now it gets interesting there's the arms race who in here mines bitcoins one two three four five that guy does too Yeah, I, yeah. This, this is a Bitcoin just talk. <laughs> I'm just, just messing with you. Um, next slide, please. Keep drinking, please. You, you, are, you are not drinking enough. Originally, mining was performed inside the local PC wallet via CPU performing hashing. There was a quantum leap with the move to GPU-based mining. At the same time, there was a rising mining, rise of mining pools. So I remember, I don't remember how, accidentally discovering Bitcoin years ago, setting up my wallet, starting to CPU mine, and didn't get any Bitcoins. And it was literally running for weeks, like three weeks or something. And I had mined zero Bitcoins. And I was about to quit. And I was talking to a buddy of mine, so I'm going to give a shout out to uh, Ledscoff. I actually called him last night. He's in California right now. I said, hey, man, I'm going to throw your name out there. And he said, oh, thanks. Uh, he said, man, there's no need to CPU mine. You need a GPU mine. I said, OK, OK, OK. So I got set up GPU mining. And uh, I was a very, very lucky man because I had, next slide, please, I had ATI 6850. Now, this is not my equipment. This is, of course, image harvested off the internet for the sake of the slide. But, of course, I intentionally ripped off all these images and verbiage that are here uh, being presented to you. But uh, I had an ATI Radeon 6850. The ATI Radeon 6850. I picked because, hey, it's a badass video card, so I thought, well, this is 3D game or something, I want to play that one day. I want to go ahead and upgrade my card. Well, as it turns out, ATI and the diverging technology of video cards, NVIDIA versus ATI, NVIDIA created these insanely powerful CPUs, GPUs. And ATI went in an opposite direction where they would create 
parallel processing GPUs. So the ATI cards have shader units that serve as your CPU GPU for this process. A 6850 has 860 shader units. So if you can imagine processing an, uh, a job and it will step up and it will parallel process out across, in essence, 860 CPUs. So it's insanely powerful. And then, of course, you get into uh, hardware manipulation and you overclock the CPU and uh, you get more and more performance out of it. And uh, so there's this whole arms race. And a few years ago, um, there was this uh, drive to acquire these ATI GPU cards for the sake of doing this. <laughs> Setting up dedicated miners in the basement of your house that would provide free heat all winter. <laughs> and boy, does it work. Now, all those uh, red plugs there on top, yes, those are power cords. So those boys right there are pulling probably 200 200 to 300 watts each so and of course you know half that's being turned it's like a hundred watt light bulb it's hot as hell it's being turned right into heat so you can't imagine how much heat this stuff makes next slide please it's outside. so um it's been a lot of time there on uh, gpus so you can imagine the step from cpu to gpu and um um to tangent off here, this also uh, means a lot, a lot more to other things besides Bitcoin. Um, computational sciences and math that require, that benefit from parallel processing, all of this tech that's being perfected in the last few years to, to make these GPUs do this, you know, uh, the uh, the drivers and um, and the um, OpenCL it is right Michael um, all this will feed into the future of uh, computational based sciences and math um, the arms race the arms race the arms race the arms race continues oh fuck it. <laughs> The arm race, arms race continues to ramp up. FPGA, who knows what that is? I'll never forget being at SummerCon 97 and hearing a talk on field programmable gateways. And I was like, holy shit. This is going to be it. In the next three years, the next three years, it's going to take over everything. I'll, I'll be I'll be trying to figure out how to program these field programmable gate arrays. It'll be awesome. That was SummerCon, summer of 1997. So um, they do have uh, certain applications, like I was previously talking about with uh, computation and stuff they're being used for. But of course, they've yet to become a commodity and be in everybody's home. But of course, they're being used to get superior performance to a GPU because you got less power usage, less heat. Now, the HBOB, ASICs. Who can tell me what ASIC stands for? Application Good, I've been drinking a lot this morning, thanks. ASICs are the uh, new weapon of choice. ASICs make field programmable gate arrays worthless. And well, yes. they uh, <laughs> nobody's buying a field program will get array. Let me put it that way. But, but to mine Bitcoin. Yeah. To mine Bitcoin. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Drink. <laughs> um, there is a there is a progression. Um, the most interesting aspect to me right now is this uh, progression of difficulty. As uh, more and more people mine, the network, in essence, tries to balance itself. 
about giving away coins and makes it more difficult. So there's your arms race. You always, you always need something more powerful to keep up this revenue stream when you're a Bitcoin miner. And so I see within the foreseeable future, the next 12 months, it may get to the point for some people that the GPU does not make enough money back to pay for the electricity. And so that's the situation we're in right now because of all the new technology coming to the market. Next. Um, there's a website on the screen. Has anybody here been to it yet? No, and you can't prove that. Okay, good, good. You're the one I need to talk to. Um, this has, uh, has anyone in the audience uh, participated in this website? <laughs> Keep drinking, boys. Well, for those of you that haven't been here, next Friday night, if you're not going out or anything and you just want to curl up at home with a nice quart of malt liquor, I really recommend that you figure out how to go to this website and you visit it just for the hell of it and check out all the interesting things available to you. Um, US, UK, British Passport, Custom scan, blah, blah, blah. oh, okay. Next slide, please. After all, we have to give the NSA something to do on Friday night. <laughs> um, there are. Uh, I've I've heard I've heard good things about what's available on screen. <laughs> Negative Ghost Rider. <laughs> Drink. <laughs> Damn it, I said drink. <sighs> so, I have no idea how many bitcoins are going to the website you see on the screen. Um, but obviously, it's part of the bitcoin economy, um, playing on that um, partial anonymousness. Um, and uh, it, transactions being able to cross borders freely and low transaction fees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There was another anonymous uh, black market site that got shut down recently, Atlantis. I heard that. He was, uh, audience member was referencing another site similar to the one on screen called Atlantis. Sorry your site got shut down, dude. It's a bummer. Here, if you want. Next. Where can I bit, buy Bitcoin? Online exchange houses, which are much like, much like other stock and currency markets. Um, there's, um, there's several exchange sites set up, and now there's a new uh, website where you can. Uh, post buy and sell orders and meet local people. I have not tried that website, though coincidentally, before I left to come to the conference yesterday, I met a friend who needed to get some cash. He had done a perfectly legal side job for somebody else who needed to pay him in Bitcoin. He got paid in Bitcoin. He called me and he said, I need money. I don't need Bitcoin. I said, okay, what do you need for it? He said, I need at least X amount of dollars. I said, well, I'll give you more than that. And uh, I, I paid him and bought the Bitcoins on site. So um, next slide, please. Um, there's an example of an exchange website. Um, one of the um, uh, things that a lot of people want to uh, hang Bitcoin for is price volatility. Um, I know a lot of you know, know, the, know the facts and I, I didn't 
when you even get the hard bit, hard numbers on all of this, but there was um, an incident in uh, Cyprus where they were having the world's first banker bail in, bail in, not bail out, as in we're just going to fucking steal everybody's money and we'll put it into the bank and call it our own. Way to win, guys. And so uh, apparently people in Cyprus that didn't want to participate in the government's capital controls um, was a flight of capital and apparently this worked to serve pushing the Bitcoin price up and creating a bubble. Before, it was d before this bubble was done with, the price had ran up to $270 in exchange, one Bitcoin for $270. Next slide, please. Uh, so there's the, there's the graph of what I just described. Um, um, if uh, any of you have sold uh, coins in the past, I'm, I'm sure that little graph there breaks your heart when you think about when you sold them for $6. And uh, next slide, please. Oh, wow, it's already over. Uh, anybody want to rant about what I've screwed up standing up here? So one thing I was wondering, you said that you're encouraged to use a new, a new address for every transaction. So what... You start over. One thing I was... It's on. It's on. It's on. One thing I was wondering is, you said there, you're encouraged to use a new address for every transaction. So, how do they plan to handle when all the possible addresses get used up? I have no fucking clue. It seems, it seems like you go the, like you go the, the universe would end. Is that like an IV, they're, they're IV6 more, kind of more more hydrogen IV. more hydrogen atoms than compose the sun type of thing. Yes. Thank you. Uh, drinking. Don't don't forget the drinking. It's gonna be the greatest question you've ever heard. So you say that there's no transaction fee. No. That's by convention. Or the. Um. That, that's that's by convention. Is what I'm asking. There there in the past often has been no transaction fee. Um. There are. There always were micro voluntary transaction fees and now at this point that we've evolved in a little bit to the future of bitcoin there are occasionally micro mandatory transaction fees they're so nominal you just hit pay and keep going but does that add up does that add up enough for the people who are going to be supporting the economy by mining after the bitcoin is, is done being created Best question ever. <laughs> Who knows? What's the, um, what's the incentive other than? So, uh, so well, if we, so if we go back and revisit the idea that um, it gets more and more difficult in that arms race to mine, and for it to mean anything because of the arms race, <laughs> the other um, open-ended thing that goes under that future topic is what is the value of Bitcoin? Because if I'm mining coins and I say, well, it's costing me $10 a month on my electric bill to run what I'm running. Well, obviously, it better pay 20% more than it's costing me or I'm wasting my time, right? Well, if Whenever you go back and run all these numbers and you say, okay, well, Bitcoin is exchanging at this rate today, and you figure out it's costing me $10 to mine, and it's, it's paying me $22, so I'm going to keep mining for the next year, right? What we don't know is we don't have perfect information about the future. Is what will the price of Bitcoin be in 90 days, 120 days? 12 months, 14 months. If you could predict that, then of course, obviously everybody would hoard and, and sell inside those bubbles. So the only way for this to possibly be viable in the future is if the price of Bitcoin keeps working its way up 
So at some point, right now, if you think about, okay, Bitcoin's at $100, Bitcoin's at $140. Well, what, what does it mean when Bitcoin is at an exchange rate back to the US dollar of $800? What does it mean when it's an exchange rate of $2,500? Then you get into that aspect of the point zero 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 five of Bitcoin, if it's $800, you know, is now actually worth something tangible. So um, that's where that comes into play. If the future, if the Bitcoin exchange rate keeps working up, then it will pay. And, uh, and so basically it's, it's, something that, it's something that has to happen. And that's part of the get rich or die trying. The price has to work up because the uh, cost of mining the coins keeps going up. And so if it doesn't, it's over. It's, it's all going to collapse, obviously. Um, but the network is set to, uh, to scale the difficulty. So a lot of people that, and I, I'm, I do not read forums. I hate forums. Everybody sits on the forums and bitches constantly. It ain't worth doing. It ain't worth investing in my new hydrogen bomb because the difficulty eight months from now is going to be so great I can't even pay for the electricity to run the damn thing. So that's my answer. Anything else? Sir? Yeah, I got a question. Hi. Uh, how, do you, um, how do you embed messages in the blockchain? I do not know. Anyone got an answer for him? Next question. I got a question. Yes. Uh, this is kind of a dumb question, but imagine your sea turtle costs ten dollars. <laughs> I can imagine a sea turtle costing ten dollars. All right, but a I'm Bitcoin with you. is currently worth one hundred twenty-four dollars. Well, hold on. Say it again. I said a Bitcoin is currently worth one hundred twenty-four dollars. I can imagine that too. I can imagine that too. How do you pay for just one turtle? So you can, you can, you can. So just like you have a nickel and a penny in the bottom of your pocket right now, and it is a, a division of that uh, dollar currency to the hundredth, um, Bitcoin is not divisible to the hundredth. It's divisible eight decimal places deep, point zero 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 zero. So. Um, that's one huge advantage it has, is it is under deflationary pressure. I talked about at the very beginning, it's not inflatable, limited to 21 million coins. So that's something that plays into this future we don't know about. Will one day the exchange rate be 800 to 1? And at that point, when you say, I need to buy $10 worth of Bitcoins to pay for my sea turtle that I'm boosting from Thailand or wherever you're stealing the damn thing from, then, uh, yeah, you just... So, one Bitcoin can be owned by many people? No. Because if I'm giving you part of my Bitcoin, pay for it's all of mine. It's way more about the encryption than it is about the encryption. So, uh, you, you're wanting to think in, in, uh, in absolutes like it's a copper penny. And you're wanting to, you want to, you want to take a stainless steel knife and saw that copper penny in half. Um, with Bitcoin, which uh, one of the things I, I this talk uh, um, could have been 12 hours long. There's a whole bunch of stuff I glossed over intentionally to try to keep this where I could get to some questions. Um, there's a unit of measure called Satoshi which is point zero 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 one bitcoins so it's divisible down to that level so that would be the penny does that answer your question okay technically that would be the pen technically that would be the pen 
So that would be the PIP uh, in, in Forex, because Penny is one, uh, four zeros to the right after that, or, uh, yeah, uh, value. So earlier you went over what's going to happen after there's no more reward for solving blocks. Although we can't... Uh, that, that, that's, that's the point when all 21 million coins are seeded in and the public holds them. Where, where are we at now? Uh, we 11 or 12, first I think. great halving back around last November. November. The, the, um, so if, if, we go, if we time travel back when I was talking about being young and happy and having a Bitcoin wallet installed and doing CPU mining and not getting anything for three weeks. Bitcoin was paying the block reward so the worker that got paid while mining, his payout would be 50 Bitcoins, which, you know, by today's standards is a, lot, is a, a decent chunk of money. So as we get deeper and deeper into this process, um, part of the aspect is the block reward gets halved on regular intervals. The halving went from 50 to 25 in November. Yeah, that's about every 2,800 on some blocks that are sold. Yeah. Block on average is just about 10 minutes, so there's going to be some flux back and forth depending upon the dynamic difficulty change. But if you're trying to figure out what's going to happen to the price when there's no more reward and it's just transaction fees, you can go back to the great halving and see what dramatic shift that did in the Bitcoin price, and you'll find that it remains pretty steady. At that point, it will just be supply and demand. How much are miners willing to sell to the exchanges, and how much are people willing to pay? And where they meet in the middle will be the new price. Oh, Correct. What about the 21 million number? Like, where are we at on that? That's what I was Halfway. 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 And it's going to take, like, a, I think another 100 years. Uh, um, it's, uh, now that we're getting into this, I wish I had a, had a slide to describe the curve. So if um, you had a graph of the amount they're getting seeded in, it looks like a logarithmic curve. Uh, it's, it's greatly declining as we get nearer and nearer to the end. So there's less and less coins coming in for the public. So that's why it'll take a hundred years. Cause it's, as you know, no, it, it um, what's the, do you remember the number of years? Like 2,120 before we get close to that. Um, it's, uh, that, that may be true. It's, um, as we get nearer and nearer to that point, the amount of coins seeded in keep going down to less and less. So, so it might be over 100 years, you're saying, before they're all mined out? Uh, it will, because it's going down the line, you get 5,000. Well, that, that, was, that was sort of relevant to my question. I was going to say, once the 21 million are mined out, um, will the price of Bitcoin go up? Because that's what you're saying. The price of Bitcoin will go up. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you can still mine the processing power required to do transactions. Will it remain steady, or will it increase the uh, transaction? Good question. The processing power is dependent upon what the mining network is applying back to it. So it actually keeps ramping up difficulty. And then there's the other, the other X factor in there is the block reward keeps getting half as you get further and further and further in. So difficulty goes up, reward goes down. But then technology goes faster and faster as well. So the arms race to the hydrogen bomb, right. But just in order, your difficulty can also decrease if you have computational it, power leave. Yeah, it, it, it is it is set it is set to float. the 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 difficulty uh, system based on the mining. So, so if everybody just gave up right now, fuck it, because I don't do it anymore. Yeah, and then it would just be except really for easy. you, except for me, it'd be really with easy. your your seller on four hundred, right? <laughs> Or you can go turn off your the breaker at your your competition. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. The entire rest of the world. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Well, that, that, well, that, that's yeah. a security issue. Yeah. Uh, so well, if you can get a knife and cut that internet cable. Back off. The power grid. Anything else? Looks like I'm up against time, sir. What?
Um, so I've got uh, 100, 100 bitcoins in my wallet, hypothetically. Yes, I can imagine that. I lose my password. Fuck. Where do those bitcoins go? They don't oh, where. This. So, so there is a finite number of bitcoins, many, many of which can potentially just be gone forever. That is correct. That's the whole point. That is, that is correct. So we're we're under a system because of your or your wallet is in essence your encryption key that holds those coins. That if you were to uh, lose your wallet, format the drive, um, it, hard drive died, don't have it backed up, all the normal stuff you know that's going to happen, you have no recourse to reobtain your wallet file and get your coins back. I, I already know, of course I already know of this happening to people, and so um, by everything I've read, these coins are lost. They're in a bottle at the bottom of the ocean. And nobody's going to get them back. And except for that physics guy with the quantum computer, I guess. But that does. But because you can't really um, assess that, it, it's not going to make the ones that are in, still in the economy more valuable. It is, though. Sir, it is. Well, how does that but, but it's the it's the it's the inverse of the Federal Reserve printing more and more and more money. Significant percentage Yeah, and it's and uh, obvious, obviously it's not. It's probably one tenth of one percent. But you think about this going, you know, the future is the big question mark. You know, will will Bitcoin will Bitcoin be viable five years, thirty years from now? It, uh, it is it is um, something to keep in mind. You better have it backed up. <coughs> when you're looking over Bitcoin and trying to figure out what it's going to do in the future, you have to keep in mind the Bitcoin economy is an Austrian economic system. It doesn't follow your classic Keynes economics models that everyone is used to from all the other fiat currencies. Damn it, that's what I wanted to get drunk and rant about. But I'm out of time. Well, you still got beer, so after your talk, uh, you come find me. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, well, there's not another speaker I'm displacing, so y'all are dismissed for lunch, and I'll just stay here and drink beers and rant. It, it, thank you. Thanks for coming, guys. I, I will be back next year. I promise I will be drunk before I get up here next time and I'm going to do a presentation on human genetics. Good thing I recommend for everyone, NPR has a video series out called Econ Stories. Is it on Netflix? I have no idea. It's on YouTube though.